All right, what's going on guys? My name is John and today we're going to be talking about image file format names and where to use different image file formats. It sounds like a nerdy topic, but it's really crucial in developing websites and applications that load quickly and maintain high image quality. It's also super helpful to understand different file formats in creating design workflows. Each of these file formats has a really specific use case, and if you can understand all of these, you can become a significantly more efficient designer. Understanding these can help maintain the quality of your website as well as the accessibility of it. So in today's video, we're going to be covering two main groups, raster images as well as vector images. Raster images are the more common of the two. They are things like JPEGs, basically pixel-based documents that uh, come together to create an image. While vector-based files are things like SVGs and AI documents that are scalable and are built from polygons. So I'm going to start off by going over the list of raster files that we're going to be using today. Each of these files, like I said before, has a specific use case and it's important to pick the correct file for what you're trying to do with it. So we're going to start off with JPEGs, which is probably the most commonly known uh, image file format. This, like I said before, is a raster-based image, which is basically a giant pile of pixels that comes together in a... Uh, cohesive image. So JPEGs are best for, uh, you know, photos, obviously. That's kind of the most typical way that you see JPEGs being used. They're best for complex images with a ton of different colors. JPEGs use lossy compression, which is great for reduced file size. That said, when you edit a JPEG, every time you make an edit, it ends up lowering the quality due to this lossy compression. A way that you can get around this loss in quality every time you edit a JPEG is by converting it to a PNG. PNGs end up being larger files, however, they do use uh, lossless compression, so when you make an edit to the image, it doesn't destroy the quality. Next we'll move on to PNGs, or Portable Network Graphics. PNGs can be created in 8-bit, 24-bit, or 48-bit. PNGs are impressive files in that they can contain up to 16 million colors. One of the most common applications for PNGs is using them for transparency. Unlike JPEGs, PNGs can actually have transparent backgrounds, so if you wanted to put a PNG over a video or something like that, like this, you, you wouldn't necessarily have to have a background in it. Since PNGs are lossless, they can also be edited a number of times without losing any of their quality. The next file format we'll talk about are GIFs, or graphic interchange formats. GIFs are kind of a unique document in that they allow for animation. GIFs are 8-bit files, which means they can only contain up to 256 colors, so they're kind of best for things like illustrations, where you don't have a ton of colors in the images. They're best for creating simple images and logos or things with animation properties attached to them. So now we'll move on to WebPs. WebPs are a file format developed by Google, and they are kind of an interesting combination of JPEGs and PNGs in that they're lossless files, but they allow for a lot of compression to allow for fast load times for the internet. Like PNGs, they offer lossless compression, but more like JPEGs, you can have smaller file sizes. Okay, so next we'll take a look at TIFFs. TIFFs are tagged image file formats. Usually TIFFs are used for publishing. TIFFs are usually pretty large, but they are a lossless document. These are best used for when you're editing a file relatively frequently. When used in programs like Photoshop, they can contain information about layers, transparency, and other tags. However, if you're using them for the internet, it's not really recommended because of their large file size. Instead, they're better used for storing a lot of image data. A lot of times, photographers will save their images as TIFF files if they're planning on printing them later. Next, we'll take a look at PSDs, or Photoshop files. Much like TIFF files, they can contain a lot of information about layers and transparencies and clipping paths. However, these files are not the best for sharing with clients because you really need Photoshop to be able to open them. So they're really not a super portable type of file. But if you're a creative team where everybody is using Photoshop and has access to the Adobe suite, Photoshop is a great way for you to store your files. They can also be opened in a lot of different Adobe programs like Premiere Pro, After Effects, and Adobe Illustrator. Next we'll move on to RAW files. So RAW files are what are used by a lot of photographers to store the maximum amount of image data straight from the camera. These are minimally processed so that when you take them into an editing program like Lightroom, there's a lot of flexibility in what you can do with the image. These files are highly editable and best used for when you're trying to uh, make different changes to an image without losing a lot of image quality. Unfortunately, with RAW files, you either need to be on the Mac OS to be able to open them, 
or else using a image editing program like Photoshop. So these are not necessarily the best files to send to a client because there's a high likelihood that they will not even be able to open them. When you import these files into Adobe Lightroom, a lot of times they are converted to DNGs or digital negatives. So next we'll move on to .bmps or bitmaps. Bitmaps are kind of an outdated file and really aren't used too much. They were developed for Windows and were used a lot for a long time, but really a TIFF is a much better version of this document. And since bitmaps are kind of specifically for Windows, again, this isn't really like a ubiquitous file format that a lot of people can open. So pretty much TIFFs are better in every way. And I would try to pretty much just avoid bitmap files. So now we'll move on to HEIFs or high efficiency image file formats. If you're taking a lot of photos on your smartphone and moving them to your computer, you might have noticed that your phone uh, automatically shoots in HEIF files. This is because they are, like the name says, very highly efficient. They also can contain information about image sequences. So if you notice when you shoot a photo on your iPhone, sometimes you can click down and hold it and you'll see that there is actually uh, like a little bit of a video attached to that file. HEIF files are best used when trying to maintain a high image quality while reducing file size. This is why it's so popular with a lot of new smartphones. However, on some older computers, uh, like one of my old professors was not able to open the file because uh, it's kind of like a newer file format. So if you're sending it to somebody with an old computer, they may or may not be able to open the file. Okay, now that we've covered HEIF files or HEIC files, we'll move on to InDesign documents. InDesign documents are best used for creating print materials. However, they can only be opened in InDesign. InDesign is a program often used for desktop publishing. They can contain information about page layouts, content on the page and things along those lines. Oftentimes, print companies will use them to create their print materials, such as magazines and newspapers. Okay, now we'll take a look at JPEG 2000 files. So JPEG 2000 files are nice because they improve image quality as well as compression ratios. However, that is all at the expense of processing power. A lot of times the entertainment industry will use JPEG 2000 files to maintain that high image quality and good compression ratios, but like I said, they come at the expense of processing power, so they might not be the best if you have a slower computer. Okay, so that covers raster image files. Now we'll move on to taking a look at vector-based images. So like I said before, vector images are made up of a ton of polygons and are made for more scalable images. And they're nice when you're trying to create an image that you plan on scaling. So like maybe a logo or something along those lines. So the first one we'll talk about is SVG or scalable vector graphic. So the file size of these is kind of dependent on the actual image size itself. But a lot of times, depending on the complexity of the colors and things within the file, they can also be relatively small files. Basically, the simpler the image, the lower the number of polygons that are needed to create it, and the smaller the file size will be. SVGs are ideal for creating company logos as well as responsive web design because they can be so easily scaled. A lot of times if you're sending a logo file over to a client, you'll send it over in an SVG so that it's something that they can easily open in most programs but maintains the nice scalability of vector files. Okay, now we'll move on to AI or Adobe Illustrator documents, which is probably one of the more common vector-based documents. Unfortunately, AI files can only be opened, obviously, in Adobe Illustrator, so they're not the best as a portable file type that you could send to a client unless they have Adobe Illustrator or access to that program. It is also nice that they can be opened in pretty much all Adobe programs like Adobe Premiere and Adobe Photoshop. If you're working with multiple people on a creative project and they all have access to the Adobe Suite, this is a great way to share vector files. Like I said though, the downside of this is you can't open them unless you have Adobe Illustrator or the Adobe Suite. All right, now we'll take a look at .eps documents or encapsulated post scripts. These files are similar to Adobe Illustrator or SVG files in that they are vector graphics and are pretty easily scalable. Before PDFs came along as a good alternative to these, they were used to share a lot of uh, vector files, but they've kind of been superseded by the PDF document. The benefit to these is that they can be opened in a lot of non-Adobe programs, but most people have like Adobe Acrobat uh, and can open PDF files, so most of the time PDFs are just a better option than EPS and they're not really used too much anymore. And then finally we'll take a look at what we just mentioned, uh, PDF documents. PDF stands for Portable Document Format. These documents can be opened in 
programs like Adobe Illustrator and basically are actually the same thing as Adobe Illustrator documents. If you open a PDF in Illustrator, it basically maintains all of the same properties as your Illustrator file. So it's nice if you're trying to export an Illustrator file and send it to a lot of people, some who may have Adobe Illustrator and some who may not. It can be opened pretty ubiquitously by everyone. These files can store a lot more than just images. They can also be used for text and multimedia. For the most part, PDF has kind of taken the place of SVG and EPS files as it has a lot of the same properties that those two file types have, but it maintains the editability in programs like Adobe Illustrator. So it's good for sharing the file with a lot of people, whether they are creatives actually using the Adobe Suite or just standard people viewing the document. So hopefully this video helped some of you guys out in better understanding the different use cases for different file formats. There's a ton of different file formats and it sounds kind of nerdy, but these can be really helpful to know. Knowing the best use cases for each file type can help decrease load times while increasing image quality and can help create a better experience for the user. As always, if you guys wouldn't mind leaving a like below for the YouTube algorithm or even a comment if you feel like it, that would be awesome. And if you're interested in more videos like this, I'd love to have you subscribe to the channel. All right, thanks so much for watching guys. I'll catch you in the next one, later.